Hey, welcome back to my channel. We are back in the series all about Shakespeare's Hamlet. I have so much to say about this next scene that I feel like I'm barely going to be scratching the surface, but hopefully I can at least give you some insight into not only what's going on, but uh, some of the characters and what I've learned over my time studying Hamlet. Today we're going to be talking about Act 1, Scene 2, which is the scene when we really get to meet the majority of our main characters. We're introduced to Hamlet in this scene. We're introduced to Claudius, to Gertrude, to Laertes, to Polonius, and uh, Horatio shows back up as well with the guards. So let's dive in without further ado. Well, slightly more ado. If you are only here for the first soliloquy, skip ahead a couple minutes because I have a lot to say about what happens before the soliloquy even starts. So. Let's dive in. In Act 1, Scene 2, all these characters are gathered, the king, the queen, the courtiers, in Elsinore, which is the name of the palace, of course. The first scene was all set on the battlements of Elsinore, but this is the first one when we're inside Elsinore Castle. And King Claudius is giving a speech that star that, that's a little interesting to me, this speech. It starts off and it sounds like he is performing a funeral for his late brother, uh, Hamlet Sr. But then it switches very quickly. So it starts off saying, Though yet of Hamlet, our dear brother's death, the memory be green, and that it us befitted to bear our hearts in grief and our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe. Dot, dot, dot. This sounds like a funeral. It seems like everybody's gotten together to mourn the death of the former king. But then he switches. It is not a funeral for very long, he says, after that ellipsis. Yet so far hath discretion fought with nature that we with wisest sorrow think on him together with remembrance of ourselves. Yeah, I see you, Claudius. That's how he rolls. Therefore our sometime sister, now our queen. So it's it shifts and suddenly it's like a celebration of the marriage that he has just finalized with Gertrude, his late brother's wife. I feel like a funeral and a wedding are two things that are kind of awkward to celebrate at the same time. Or celebrate? Do you celebrate a funeral? Not really. Two, two kinds of ceremonies that don't normally mesh together. And yet Claudius just goes effortlessly from one to the next. And that's not all. It's not just funeral-like. Uh, or wedding reception like he continues and says thank you for going along with my marriage to Gertrude and by the way war is brewing with Fortinbras if you don't know about that whole situation you can check out my video on act one scene one which lays out all the basics there so if you're following along I don't know if you are but if you have a copy of Hamlet with you like this handy version which is super cheap Dover Thrift Editions are the way to go if you want some cheap, accurate uh, literature. Anyway, if you're following along, we're still at the very beginning of Act 1, Scene 2, about eight lines down from where I was reading before. Claudius continues, now follows, that you know, young Fortinbras, holding a weak supposal of our worth, or thinking by our late dear brother's death, our state to be disjoint and out of frame, Colleagued with this dream of his advantage, he hath not failed to pester us with message, importing the surrender of those lands lost by his father. So he switches from a funeral to sort of a wedding to a, a war council or a state of the union kind of address. What we get from this is a few things about the character of King Claudius. We get that the man is efficient. He can just get things done. We also get that he he doesn't seem all that sentimental. If he's able to, in one breath, celebrate, I guess, all of these things at once, commemorate all these things at once, then he's not somebody who's going to cry too much over somebody's death or, or weep with joy at his wedding or something like that. He is somebody who gets things done and then moves right along. So the reason he brings up Fortinbras is to propose a solution to Fortinbras, who is threatening 
uh, Denmark with the army that he's getting up. And his solution, it's so junior high, the solution that he comes up with. I mean, it's, it's diplomacy, so if it works, that's great. But he says, I'm going to send some letters to his uncle, the king of Norway, telling, telling the king what's going on and that he should stop his nephew from trying to attack Denmark. Okay, so your dad tells his dad, hopefully that works out. Apparently the king of Norway is impotent and bedridden, so he has no idea what's going on, yet he's still the king, so he has enough power to stop everything that's happening with Fordenbrus, which is uh, great, I guess, if it works out. So to that purpose, Claudius sends Voltamand and Cornelius, two characters that are not super important, off to deliver those letters, and everybody breaks into applause, presumably, about how efficient and wonderful Claudius is, and that's the end of his speech. Then he turns to Laertes. Claudius turns to Laertes. I didn't actually notice how odd this was until I saw the David Tennant uh, Royal Shakespeare Company version of Hamlet, which I would highly recommend and I will be referencing periodically throughout this whole series. Patrick Stewart in that version plays Claudius and does just an outstanding job and you can tell that it's odd that he turns to Laertes first of all the people who are there. He really should turn to Hamlet first, but he doesn't. He turns to Laertes and says, is there something that I can help you with? You have some question for me. And, and he makes it all theatrical and very political, the way he, he addresses Laertes. You can't speak to the Dane and lose your voice, he says. It, the Dane, that just means that he's the king of Denmark. Anytime somebody is referenced, uh, a person is referenced as the Dane or Norway, the country or the person from that country, that's just the king. So you can't speak to me, the king, and have your plea go unanswered, he says to this huge group of people. I see you, Claudius. I see you. I see what you're doing. So, Laertes replies, I, I've done my duty by coming home for your coronation, which is an interesting way of, of putting it. And now I want to go back to France. Polonius agrees, more on Polonius later, since I already have so much to say about this scene, I'm not going to dwell on him. And then Claudius says, great, you go back to France, you do that thing. And everyone presumably applauds yet again. One thing I want you to notice about Claudius is how often he uses the royal we. You know, our belief is this. It's not our belief, it's your belief. This was a typical thing for kings to do, to use the royal we, but man, Claudius has been king for what? Days? Not very long. He falls into this a little too easily, I think. Anyway, Claudius then turns to Hamlet, our main character at last. Somebody speaks to him at last. He's he gets to say something. And Claudius says, and now my cousin Hamlet and my son. Now, before anybody gets all weirded out, cousin or cuz was just a term in Shakespeare's day that meant close relation or friend. It's kind of like when everybody said bro back, back when I was in high school, nobody was actually a bro, <laughs> a brother to somebody. It's just what you would say if you were really close to someone. So when he says, now my cousin Hamlet and my son, how is it that the clouds still hang on you? You can tell how irritated Claudius is by Hamlet's insistence on being sad. Now let's remember, Hamlet's father, whom he dearly loved, and we see that very clearly throughout this, this play. Hamlet's father, whom he dearly loved, has just died recently, in about two months ago. And Hamlet comes back after hearing of his father's death to Denmark just to find that not only is his beloved father deceased suddenly because of a freak accident, freak accident, but also to find that Claudius has remarried, has married his mother and taken over the kingship. That should have been Hamlet's, but instead Claudius just snuck on in there. So Hamlet has a lot of reasons to be upset and to be sad. And it hasn't really been long enough for him to just get over his sadness. Yet, he says, how is it that the clouds still hang on you? 
and his, and even Gertrude, his mother. More on her later. I have lots of questions about Gertrude. Lots of questions. Uh, even Gertrude says, "Why? Why is it so particular? Why are you so sad about?" your father dying. You know that it's common, all that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. Yes, it's true, it's a common thing, but doesn't it make you kind of completely heartless if you don't care uh, that somebody dies? So that, that part is extremely weird to me, and it's weird to Hamlet too. He says, uh, it, it doesn't seem particular to me. I, I don't seem sad now. I can't just flip a switch. And he goes through this whole list of things that could you could pretend to be sad with. He says, look, I'm wearing black, you know, like a, like a moody theater kid. Yeah, I'm sighing and, and crying and what have you. People could pretend all those things, but I have that within, he says, that passes show these but the uh, the trappings and the suits of woe. It's interesting that here he says, I, I am not seeming to be something, I'm the real deal. When later in the play he is going to seem like something and not really be the real deal. So just just food for thought there. Remember, remember in my kind of dumb but fun reenactment in the Act 1 Scene 1 video, when, at the very, very beginning of the play, one of the guards says, who's there? But it's not the guard that's on duty, it's the one that's coming up. Both of these things, that who's there from the wrong person, and the I'm not pretending to be sad, I actually am sad, from Hamlet in Act 1, Scene 2, both of those seem to highlight the theme of identity. What does it mean to be who you are? What determines your role in life? your personality. When do, what does it mean to be authentic? So, there you go. That one's, that one's for free. I'm just going to throw that question out there. After this, Claudius is really terrible. At first, there, there are some questions about Claudius when he brings up his brother and then swiftly, swiftly moves on to something else. It's a bit of a red flag, but after Hamlet says, I don't seem sad, I am sad. Claudius just goes into this rant about how ridiculous it is to mourn for a long period of time at all. It is unmanly grief. He just goes on and on. If I were Hamlet, I would be absolutely enraged as Claudius is, is saying these things in front of a huge group of people, no less. It seems to me that as Claudius goes on in this speech, he realizes partway through that he's actually being watched and he, his tone shifts completely. So again, if you're following along, this is uh, in the middle of Act 1, Scene 1, it's the second, or Act 1, Scene 2, it's the second big speech by the king. He says to Hamlet, it is a fault to heaven, a fault against the dead, a fault to nature, to reason most absurd, his grief, that is, whose common theme is death of fathers, and who still hath cried from the first corpse that he, from, till he that died today, this must be so. It, it, he's, he's saying this is wrong in every conceivable way that you are mourning for your father. And then he switches right after that. He says, we pray you, Throw to earth this unprevailing woe, and think of us as of a father. Suddenly he throws Hamlet a bone. Think of us as of a father. This is the first piece of comfort that he tries to offer Hamlet, and it's, it's a complete fail in my opinion. He's just been berating Hamlet for his grief, and now he says, oh, to make you feel better, think of me as of a father. I'd rather not thank you. Hard pass from me. And the second thing that he says to comfort Hamlet is, and let the world take note, you are the most immediate to our throne. And with no less nobility of love than that which dearest father bears his son, do I impart toward you. That might seem generous. Let the world take note, you are the most immediate to our throne. You're going to succeed me one day. 
But that was literally Hamlet's situation before Claudius came in. Claudius snuck in there and took the throne, and uh, it should be Hamlet on the throne. Whether or not he would make a good king better than Claudius is kind of a different question, one that I'll tackle later on. But this is, this is some cold comfort right here. And then Claudius says, don't go back to college in Wittenberg. Uh, come, come stay with us. Hamlet throughout this whole thing does not reply, which I find noteworthy. And then the queen repeats the same plea. Why don't you not go to school in Wittenberg? He only responds to her, which I think is really important. He says, I shall in all my best obey you, madam. He even repeats madam, just so that Claudius knows he is talking to his mom. He is not talking to Claudius. He never directly addresses him because he's, he's so upset. The king puts up with it and then everybody leaves but Hamlet. So here's where we get to the soliloquy. So you guys who've been waiting for that first soliloquy through this whole 15 minute video so far, uh, thank you, appreciate that. Okay, so the first soliloquy. Hamlet is left alone and he begins. Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would melt thaw and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter, oh god. It's a heartbreaking opening. Some people have played this beginning uh, in an angry fashion, but the most effective ways that I've seen, uh, my favorite being Kenneth Branagh and, and David Tennant, play this really sadly. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Hamlet in the middle of the play says, to be or not to be, very famously. But even before that, he has been contemplating suicide. He has been struggling with depression. And we see that really clearly here. The line that comes right after what I just said, how, which is this, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world has been echoed in so many other great pieces of literature and I think is one of the clearest expressions of what depression actually means that I've ever read. How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to meet all the uses of this world. He just sweeps it all all away as, as useless, weary, stale. Now at this point, the main reason he seems upset is his mother's remarriage. I would think it'd be his father's death. I would think it'd be Claudius swooping in and taking the throne, but it isn't. He does mention those things, and he is sad about those things, but it's mostly his mother remarrying so quickly after his father's death. He says this a little bit after what I read the last time that it should come to this, but two months dead. Nay, not so much, not two. So excellent a king that was to this Hyperion to a satyr. Now, I know that's not a complete sentence. In this soliloquy, the syntax is all messed up because Hamlet is so distraught that he can't put together a complete idea. You see dashes, a lot more dashes. It's almost like Emily Dickinson through this soliloquy way more than in any of the others because he is so emotionally charged. But what I want to point out is that his mother married somebody who is like a satyr compared to Hamlet Sr. who was like Hyperion. Hyperion is the sun god who actually comes up a couple times in Hamlet, the uh, the analogies that Hamlet puts forward. So he saw his father more like the sun god, and then a satyr is, in Greek plays, basically a horny goat man. Very low comedy kind of character. So you can see that it's the fact that his mother went from someone who is so magnificent as his father was, to somebody who is so much less frailty, he says, thy name is woman. How could she do this? 
and the focus is really all on Gertrude. The focus shifts a little bit. He, he's, he's always hung up on this, but the focus shifts later in the play, but at the beginning, the main reason that he's upset is because of his, his mother. At the end of this soliloquy, the very last line is, break my heart for I must hold my tongue. This is the first time that we really see the idea of Hamlet not being able to speak his mind. I recently heard about a novel that came out. I will I'll look up the title and I'll include a link to the, the book below. But it's about Hamlet, essentially. It's a retelling of Hamlet set in the Midwest, and the person who is representing Hamlet is literally a mute person who can't speak at all. I haven't read this book. Uh, the tone of it doesn't really sound like my, my cup of tea, but I'm intrigued by the idea because Hamlet does feel this inability to speak throughout the entire story, and he keeps bringing that up quite a bit. After that, of course, Horatio comes in, his buddy, along with Marcellus and Bernardo, the guards. Horatio, Horatio is Hamlet's best friend, and frankly, I think he's, he's too good for Hamlet throughout the play. I'll talk more about it, but he really is a truly good friend to Hamlet, who's a little, or a lot, unhinged. The only thing I want to say about this next bit is that it's easy to read over Hamlet's epic sass. His sense of humor is terrible and wonderful, and we get to see it really clearly here with his interaction with Horatio. The first thing he says that I love is, the funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. Thrift, thrift, Horatio. Now, what he's saying after Horatio has just said, I've, I've come back to see your, your father's funeral. And, and Hamlet replies with this, he says, oh, yeah, yeah. No, I think it was I think it was for my mother's wedding. We were trying to save money, I understand. We could just bring out the leftovers from the funeral and use that for the wedding. Save some cash. I mean, it's, it's cold. Not, that wasn't a pun. It's cold, what Hamlet says there. And then Hamlet starts falling into his, his the darkness of his mind and saying, oh, I can see, I can see my father now. Basically, meaning he would hate this. And when Horatio replies, where, where do you see him? Since he had just seen his father. Hamlet, I can just see the half-masked sass eyes on Hamlet when he looks at Horatio and says, in my mind's eye, I can't actually see my father. But the comedic timing is just so, so incredible. Of course, at that point, Horatio says, actually, your father is out and about. We could actually have seen him because he's, he's walking around. So we get this back and forth set of questions that's really pretty realistic, I think. Uh, you can tell that Hamlet is unsure about the, the idea of his father returning. He's fascinated. But there's this sense of disbelief. Wait, did he look like this? What was his expression like? How long did it stay? I mean, he wants to know all of these details. And Horatio and the guards go through all of that. Hamlet finally says that at the very end of the scene, if it, that is the ghost, if it assume my noble father's person, I'll speak to it, though hell itself should gape and bid me hold my peace. It's interesting that he says this. Though hell itself should gape and bid me hold my peace. I mentioned in my video on Act 1, Scene 1, that there's a possibility that this ghost of Hamlet's father was not originally meant by Shakespeare to be a ghost, but to be a demon who's sent to deceive Hamlet and cause the downfall of Denmark. Not everybody thinks this, but the idea that Hamlet is not going to stop, even if hell were to gape and bid him hold his peace and not speak to this, tell him not to speak to this ghost, is interesting. It's a little fuel to that fire. So anyway, 
There is a ton more that I could say about this scene, but this video has already gone really long, so if you have any questions, please feel free to post them below. Like this video if you liked it, and don't forget to subscribe. I post new videos on Mondays, so I hope to see you then.